Good evening, everyone, and uh, a very great welcome to this tonight's launch of the Centre for Climate Change Innovation. My name is Brian Hoskins, and I'm chair of the Grantham Institute at Imperial College. Um, and I was the founding director of the Grantham Institute as well. And I just want to say why I moved to do that. And I was very much a, a scientist looking into weather and climate. And I went to Imperial, to the Grantham Institute, because I felt this was such an urgent problem. And we really had to get to grips with this, the challenge of climate change. And Imperial College and the Grantham Institute was really the place to do that and to make a difference. And this center very much follows that line. It's, it's there to make a difference on climate change. So before we start the proceedings, I'd like to make a, a few acknowledgements. First, I have to acknowledge the core support of the Grantham Foundation and Jeremy and Han Handelor Grantham. Um, without their fantastic support, the Grantham Institute, let alone this center, would not exist. And we really, we really welcome that and, and value it. And um, the second thing I'd like to do is acknowledge two people who won't appear tonight. And it's Richard, um, Richard Templer and um, Martin Siegert. So Richard was the key player in our efforts to stimulate the innovation necessary to tackle climate change over many years while I was the director as well. And in the last few years, Martin Siegert, the co-director of the Grantham Institute following me, has joined with Richard in driving plans forward for a Centre for Climate Change Innovation. And the other crucial ingredient for this was when Sir Richard Sykes came, visited and laid out a challenge to collaborate with the Royal Institution on an innovation centre. And that enabled us to combine the plans that we had and the ambitions uh, with what Sir Richard was talking about and to bring us to this point that we're here today. So that's what we're doing today to launch this centre that follows on from that. We have a very busy programme with many excellent speakers and panellists. So um, we'll get straight on with the proceedings now. And we're honoured to start with uh, a pre-recorded message. And I would like to introduce that now, a pre-recorded message for this launch from His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales. Ladies and gentlemen, Having uh, launched my Sustainable Markets Initiative at Davos last year uh, in January, and then as part of this initiative, my Terra Carta, as a roadmap to recovery uh, for nature, people and planet, I am really delighted to have been invited to join the launch of the Centre for Climate Change Innovation at Imperial College and the Royal Institution as a way to highlight the critical importance of science, technology, and innovation to solving the increasingly urgent climate and biodiversity crises. With less than nine years left to prevent irreversible damage to our planet, it is absolutely critical that we invest in sustainable solutions, alternatives, and industries. Uh, whether it is uh, biomimicry, uh, renewable energy, sustainable transportation, carbon capture, biotech, uh, soil regeneration, nature-based solutions, or green infrastructure. We are on the verge of catalytic breakthroughs that will alter our view of what is possible and profitable within the framework of a sustainable future. To move forward, we must acknowledge that sustainability and profitability are no longer mutually exclusive. Effective solutions must ensure that sustainable technologies and alternatives are competitively priced. Our science-based and economic systems are vital to finding and scaling uh, the solutions we so desperately need. We've seen uh, in the last decade how quickly sustainable technologies can advance if there is a, a strong market signal and a clear sense of direction. This is absolutely essential if we are to accelerate the pace 
uh, since innovation will allow us to move from the linear exploitation of finite planetary resources into a secular and sustainable era. As outlined uh, in the Terra Carta, I would just like to highlight, if I may, some key actions where I believe the Centre for Climate Change and Innovation can help to accelerate global action and solutions. First of all, uh, exploring a comprehensive industry strategy for science, technology and innovation with clear entry points for investment aligned to industry and country roadmaps. Secondly, uh, supporting the transdisciplinary nature of innovation, research and development. Uh, this includes connecting nature, science, technology and engineering with complex systems thinking, traditional knowledge and design thinking. Thirdly, uh, exploring and investing in the potential of biomimicry and the study of nature to accelerate the sustainable transition in almost every industry. Fourthly, uh, reinforcing the opportunity of technology-driven transformation with a focus on sustainable value and the role of technology as enablers of industrial, social and environmental progress, including, for example, uh, carbon capture, use and storage, both engineered and nature-based, to reduce emissions and to help, most importantly, draw down legacy carbon in the atmosphere. Fifthly, and finally, uh, enhancing access to continuous education and training of young people, uh, of communities and employees, in line with the skills, uh, jobs and opportunities of a sustainable future. Ladies and gentlemen, with this being a critically important year for the environment, it is my hope that the Centre for Climate Change uh, Innovation can play a really catalytic role in advancing the ambitions of the Terra Carta with the support of my Sustainable Markets Initiative. This uh, includes the exploration of climate and biodiversity game changes in partnership with the private sector, uh, with investors, countries and global academic and research institutions. Now, as I have been trying to get across for quite some time. I'm afraid we are rapidly running out of time. The current pandemic has shown us that human health, economic health and planetary health are fundamentally interconnected. It has also shown us that it is entirely possible to accelerate solutions when we work together for a higher common purpose, as has been clearly demonstrated during wartime. With a time of the very essence, we need above all to put ourselves on a war footing. So I very much look forward to the critical work we can advance together in the months ahead. Thank you, Sir Brian and His Royal Highness. I am Ian Wormsley, the Provost of Imperial College London, and it's a pleasure to join this launch event today. As the Prince of Wales has said, tackling the climate crisis is the most vital and urgent challenge of our time. The evidence is beyond dispute. Action is needed now from governments, from businesses, from innovators, and indeed from all of us. We need to develop new technologies and products to drive new policies, international agreements and investments, and at an individual level, create unprecedented behavior change. We need radical solutions to reduce carbon emissions and to mitigate the damage already done. This center will provide a place to develop these radical solutions and to accelerate the development of cutting edge technologies. It will provide a locus where the best innovators meet the funders with the capacity to support their ideas, where funders can build their green investment portfolios, and where policymakers see what is possible to tackle the causes and the effects of the climate crisis. 
It will lead to the creation of climate-friendly education, skills, and work, and support new companies to deploy new technologies as they grow and teach existing business how to be greener to embed real change. A key aspect of this unique partnership is that it invites everyone's participation in creating solutions. Its work will be informed by reaching out to the full range of London citizens, many of whom are often excluded from the climate solutions conversation. By working collaboratively from the outset, with partners from multiple sectors, and with an open door to new partners and participants, we hope to really multiply the impact of the centre's work. Imperial is delighted to be a founding partner. It aligns with our core research and education mission, our transdisciplinary approach, and represents a key theme of our academic strategy, which is helping societies to become more sustainable by transforming manufacturing attitudes to consumption and economic practices. It also builds on our expertise in innovation and translation, applying our industrial and our scientific know-how to help change the narrative and to work towards creating a net zero economy by the middle of the century. The Grantham Institute has a formidable reputation for engaging policymakers, business leaders, and the public, as well as running a highly successful climate change innovation ecosystem. Over the past decade, the college has produced more startups in these fields than any other UK university. Imperial was a founding partner of the EU Climate Knowledge Innovation Community, and since 2012 has delivered the Climate Kick Accelerator Program, one of the world's leading climate change solutions accelerators. In just eight years, 55 startups completed the program and raised over $200 million. This new center is ideally situated in London, already a leader in the clean technology innovation, where scientists, innovators, investors, businesses, policymakers, and the public can all collaborate. But it will have a much bigger impact on a national and a global scale to help shape a climate resilient future, to catalyze the fight for the future of our planet and for the generations that come after us. I'm happy to hand over now to uh, Sir Richard Sykes, the chairman of the Royal Institution, our partners in this endeavor. Thank you very much, Ian. And uh, as you say, I'm a great friend of uh, Imperial College as well. I'd like to start by saying just how encouraging it was to hear His Royal Highness, who is the patron of the RI, giving such support and quite rightly challenge to this vital new initiative that we are undertaking together. In the 1850s, a scientist at the RI, John Tyndall, was undertaking research that helped to prove the existence of what we know today as greenhouse gases, thereby establishing the principles of global warming and climate change. That we're only now beginning to take serious action around the world, some 160 odd years later, is to nobody's credit, of course. But we are here and we're now taking action to reduce carbon emissions, prevent further damage, and to develop mitigations against that damage that we've already done. And that is vital and urgent purpose of a new Centre for Climate Change Innovation. And it's appropriate that the new Centre will be located at the RI, not least for the link with Tyndall and the long history the RI has with Imperial, but for our expertise in public engagement with science. Tyndall, Faraday, Longsdale, Davy, the scientists who researched at the RI, all placed as much importance on public engagement as they did on the research that they were undertaking. And it remains our mission today to create opportunities for everyone to discover, discuss, and critically examine science. And that is important because public support and understanding are vital to the success of the centre and to the success of practical solutions which will be developed here. We have the public engagement and educational experience and specialists at the RI that will make this possible. We have digital channels giving international reach, including a YouTube channel that almost 1 million sub subscribers uh, click into all the time, and that has huge potential for growth. 
We have a well-established education program, strong links with schools across the country. We have an active program of live stream science talks and, of course, in normal times, live events in our theatre, which we hope to be returning to soon. We have the Christmas lectures with a worldwide audience of millions, which last year focused so acutely on the challenges that we face as a result of human activity disrupting the delicate balance of the Earth's systems. And of course, the RI will also be the physical home of the new centre. Our iconic building is an internationally recognised home of British science and holds within it an extraordinary archive and heritage. But it's also a living, working hub for science enthusiasts of all ages, centrally located close to the sources of investment, scientific expertise and government. Importantly, it has the space to allow for the collaboration and informal encounters that innovation thrives on and the space to welcome the public, scientists, business leaders and policy makers. I'm very clear that the centre and our partnership with Imperial is an opportunity for the Royal Institution, including all those who work there and everyone who supports us to make a big positive difference to what we all recognise as a defining challenge facing humanity. Science is transformative and has the power to shape our lives and shape our lives it must because we will not have another 160 years to get this right. If we act now, seriously and urgently, then there is an opportunity to address the human made damage to our environment and the societal issues that it brings. We have an opportunity to help shape the world we want to leave for our children and our grandchildren. So I'm delighted and excited by the fact that the RI can make another significant contribution to tackling climate change through practical science and innovation nearly two centuries after John Tyndall made the first. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ian and Richard, from the two core institutions in this partnership. But also crucial to this is it's in London, and London is very much what it's all about to start with. So it's a great pleasure to introduce Shirley Rodriguez, the Deputy Mayor of London, who's going to give us a few words. Thank you for that kind introduction, Brian, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, the Mayor of London, Sadiq Khan, has asked me to pass on his apologies. He's sorry he can't be here. Um, but he and I would like to thank Imperial College London and the Royal Institution for your efforts in establishing this Centre for Climate Change Innovation. I'd also like to play, uh, pay tribute to His Royal Highness, the Prince of Wales, who's been a long-standing and vocal advocate for climate action. Given the climate emergency, the Mayor has committed to make London net zero by 2030, and he's doing everything in his power to achieve that, from establishing the world's first ultra low emission zone, setting zero carbon standards for all new buildings, drawing up plans to switch the tube to renewable energy, to supporting the divestment of pension funds from fossil fuels into responsible investment. London is already a global hub for climate action and the green economy generates around 50 billion pounds worth of sales for London. It's a key employment sector more than the construction and manufacturing sectors combined. But as we look to recovery from the social and economic impacts of COVID-19, the Mayor and the London Recovery Board are committed to collaborating to at least double this sector and to help support London's green and fair recovery. So it's important that the centre is accessible to all Londoners and communities and that a just transition to a low carbon and circular economy is at the heart of how it involves educates and raises awareness around climate change. As we make the transition to a zero carbon city, there are going to have to be changes to how we live and work. And it's really vitally important that we truly are creating opportunities for all. This new centre is going to play an important role in achieving our ambitions, 
creating the climate change businesses and innovators of tomorrow, as well as the green jobs and skills our city needs now. And it's vital that we catalyze new technology and innovation to tackle what is the greatest challenge of our time. And that's why the mayor and I are proud to support this new center. Thank you very much, Shirley, for that message. Now we, we come to the panel, and we have 11 excellent panellists, and I'm going to introduce them, but Shirley is on the panel, you've already heard from Shirley, and Alyssa Gilbert, the Policy Director at the Grantham Institute, and the Interim Director of the, the new centre is from one of the core institutions, and you'll hear from Alyssa in a moment. And from the Royal Institution, we had the Director of the Royal Institution, Lucinda Hunt, and again, you'll hear from Lucinda in just a moment. But I'd like to introduce now some of those from outside the core institutions. We have 11 on the panel altogether, and five people then from the founding partner organizations. And I'd like to introduce those now, but I'm going to do that with a, a question for each of them, please. So just a question, what is the need for a center like this? And what role do you see your organization playing? So that's the exam question for the five people I'm about to introduce then. And the first one then is Michaela Wright, who is Head of Corporate Sustainability at HSBC UK. So Michaela. Thank you, Sir Brian. So um, I'd just like to say HSBC, we, we recognise the impacts of climate change and we've got an ambition to be the leading bank for the transition to net zero economy and really accelerating the transition to a low carbon thriving global economy through finance and investment. We, we know that radical ideas are needed to tackle climate change, but turning those concepts into commercially viable solutions at a global scale really requires investment and, and governance. So we want to be, um, and we, we are joining this partnership to create those new frontiers of opportunity and sustainable finance by unlocking innovative new climate solutions in technology, nature and infrastructure. So we're looking for innovations that really can reduce the impact of climate change. So things such as clean tech, innovations that can reduce and avoid the environmental impacts. And then those nature-based solutions as well, those that will protect and restore nature to absorb emissions through, through their natural carbon sink potential. And, and we want to support those to scale. And so our partnership with Imperial College London at, at the Royal Institution is, is part of our global philanthropic programme. So we aim to donate $100 million to scale climate innovation ventures, renewable energy and nature-based solutions between now and 2025. And HSBC UK is incredibly proud to be a founding partner of this new Centre of Climate Change Innovation helping to catalyze innovation of all forms that address the causes and effects of climate change. And, and we understand we have a responsibility to our customers, employees, and wider society, and that to achieve success in the long term, economic growth must also be sustainable. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Michaela. Great to have you on board. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to turn to Lucy Yu, who is the CEO of Optimus Centre for Net Zero. Lucy. Thank you, Sir Brian. Um, so um, we here all agree that tackling the climate emergencies is the most urgent challenge of our time. And um, with the good news is that we already have some of the tools and resources that we need to tackle it. Um, but we just need to quickly determine how to channel and, and deploy them effectively. So um, to do that, we're going to need to collaborate and, and cooperate at, at an unprecedented scale. And, and this is why the centre is so important because in its very design, it will bring uh, different people and organisations with different skill sets and perspectives together. Um, and experience shows us that bringing together of different disciplines and backgrounds is, is a really perfect uh, recipe for innovation. 
So our mission at the Octopus Centre for Net Zero is to realise faster, fairer and, and more affordable paths to net zero through research. And the research that we do is founded on data driven modelling and simulation. Um, but we need inputs from others to shape the direction of our research and, and to influence the, the, the directions that we choose to take and in some cases to, to provide the data that we'll use. Um, so through the centre we'll have access to a very broad range of experts and, and we'll be working across the centre's partners to, to really bake their expertise and their contributions into the, the modelling that we do. Uh, we also want our research to reach the widest audience possible and, and not just the people like um, many of you in the audience who already work on these issues day to day. Uh, we want to be at the bus stop, we want to be at the water cooler, we want to be starting the conversations that spark the change. Um, the Royal Institution has a terrific history of discourse um, and so we're incredibly excited about the opportunities for public engagement and for educating the next generation that this relationship presents. Thank you very much indeed, Lucy. Um, so I'd like to turn to Tony O'Sullivan now, who's the CEO of Pollination. So over to you, Tony. Oh, we can't hear you, Tony. I'm sorry. Thank you very much, Sabra. Um, so the centre has been created to radically increase the speed with which practical solutions can tackle the climate crisis. This is entirely aligned with Pollination's own mission of accelerating to uh, transitioning to net zero to a climate resilient future. Uh, for those that don't know, uh, Pollination is an investment advisory firm. Uh, it has a singular focus, and that is about advising governments and corporations and investing, all with the aim of uh, getting to a net zero future. We're a mission driven organisation uh, that actively seeks out breakthrough ideas that can catalyze decarbonization. And we see the center as providing the ecosystem within which such ideas can be born and curated. In turn, we expect the center to deliver practical investable innovations that can make a real difference uh, urgently and a scale never achieved before. The center will allow disruptors and innovators to do things differently because tomorrow's opportunities need more than yesterday's solutions. And we look forward to supporting the centre in such uh, in, in such a way. Some of the um, practical ways in which we could assist the centre, we believe, is um, our range of, across a range of initiatives. For example, uh, we could be focused on the acceleration of the capital towards nature-based solutions. So Pollination is a founding member of uh, HRH Prince of Wales Natural Capital Investment Alliance, which has been formed under the auspices of the Sustainable Markets Initiative, Terra Carta. The Alliance will work with the Centre on the development of natural capital innovation hubs, where the ideas and technological solutions of tomorrow can germinate and flourish. It is hoped that the Centre will become an innovation and technical partner of our pollinator. This is a new greenfield development platform which is designed by Pollination to develop investable transition sol solutions uh, centred around specific climate challenges. Uh, Pollination is an incredibly proud uh, founding partner of this centre and uh, thank you very much Sir Brian. Thank you Tony and I'd like to turn now to uh, Dr Barbara Lane who's from Arup where she's UK leader of Applied Innovation and Technology Group. So Barbara. Thanks, Sir Brian. So Arup has made a commitment to uh, meaningfully contribute to sustainable development as defined by the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. These goals provide us with the lens to challenge, frame and expand the impact of our work. Our purpose is to shape a sustainable future which we define as our contribution to a safer, more resilient and more inclusive world for everyone. Our independence as a firm allows us to make better choices and ensure everything we do ultimately creates healthy people, healthy places and a healthy planet. We've realised that we can't solve all of these challenges alone and intense, rigorous and sustained focus and collaboration is needed across academia, industry and government. 
And this is needed if the UK and other leading governments are to meet their net zero carbon and biodiversity targets within the required time frame, and to embed resilience into ever evolving complex built and natural systems. ARAP has invested in research for more than 70 years through our own university. So we have seen firsthand the transformative potential that research and innovation can have on solutions to some of the world's greatest challenges. This new Center for Climate Change Innovation will accelerate the rate of innovation at a regional and global scale, and we are delighted to be involved as a founding partner. Thank you very much indeed, Barbara. We're delighted to have you too. So finally in this group then of the founding partner organizations, we have Jeff Twentyman, who's a senior partner at Slaughter and May. Jeff. Thank you, Sir Brian, and thank you for promoting me to senior partner. I'm a senior partner rather than a senior partner. Um, thank you all very much for, for, for having us here. Uh, climate change and sustainability challenges are far too great for isolated responses and they need collaboration like no other challenges and, and this center offers the opportunity for collaboration and openness at its very core there's so much good work going on so many platforms and initiatives but it's really essential that we also have those which are cross cross sectoral and multidisciplinary so the center offers an opportunity for a a marketplace of ideas and place to stimulate and catalyze and amplify as so sort of a crucible of ideas and against the background of all of the things that the center will be working on there is of course the system of law and law touches intellectual property and innovation financial markets carbon trading and energy markets investment and commercialization and the governance of business and the way in which people run businesses. So the law and the legal system will touch on everything that the centre produces, whether it's technological, policy focused or market focused. And we very much want to contribute our expertise uh, to, to the centre's outcomes. Law firms have got a long history of pro bono support for good causes and pro bono is not just philanthropic it can also be strategic and i can't think of a better more important place for us to lend our influence and support so delighted to be involved thank you jeff and uh, i'm glad you're happy about your promotion so um we've had five people from the founding partner organizations but now to return to those who are going to really drive things forward doing things we we've got three people three young leaders, as we call them here, to, to fill out the panel at the end, move from eight to 11. And um, so the first of those, and I should say the question, the exam question changes slightly because it's what is need for a centre like this and what should the centre do? So the pressure is on you to say what it should do. So Caitlin Well is the first, and she's part of the team at Counteract. Caitlin. Thank you very much, Sir Brian. Excited to be here and just to give context of from where I'm coming from. So Counteract, we invest in, in people and ideas that are very early stage and companies that are removing carbon dioxide and equivalent greenhouse gases from that atmosphere. And we really see the climate change center for innovation as an opportunity to collaborate and bring together great minds from different perspectives and being in that very early stage risky investment space there's a bit of a chasm between creating an idea and getting institutional funding and this space could be a great one to help for instance entrepreneurs have pilot projects with big corporates where they can work together to solve some of the problems and then also get access to some some of the technical know-how and understand how kind of research in the space is developing is is a great open way to to kind of develop the market and grow symbiotically and also i think there could be an opportunity for the center to really have an international reach and and bring perspectives from different parts of the globe because if we want to solve climate change it really has to take all those different perspectives so 
I see it as an awesome way to, to bring a collaborative operational experience, new ideas and, and big corporates up to speed with how we can advance the industry. And I'm really excited to be part of that journey. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Caitlin. So I'd like to move to Martha McPherson now, who's head of green economy and sustainable growth at UCL's Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose. Over to you, Martha. Thank you. So what I really want to bring to the table here today is to ensure that we're getting into the real meaning of what innovation is. Innovation is not just made up of random eureka moments or bolts from the blue. Instead, one of the key characteristics of innovation is its cumulative nature. Innovation can really only build on and be directed by the long history of past innovation of what's got us to where we are today. And it's also collaborative, as other speakers have said, not just lone geniuses working away, but derived from multiple sources, from business, from governments, from academia, and from lone individuals as contributors of value to the innovation ecosystem. Innovation is also very path dependent, meaning that it has issues of incumbency, of lobbying, of balances and misbalances of economic power. So innovation and the finance that sits behind it are far from neutral at any one time. And I think that any organization that wants to truly stake itself on thinking about the way that innovation works for the climate crisis needs to start by considering the position that we're working from today. And we know from research undertaken at the Institute for Innovation and Public Purpose, where I'm affiliated, that the public sector can frequently be relegated to a relatively narrow innovation role in just fixing market failures, tinkering around the edges and fixing the negative externalities that fall out of the market. And that really needs to shift to where the public sector could be more actively policy making to shape, to co-create markets, to take them in a green innovation direction. And we also know from the work that I now do in sustainability consulting at Design Portfolio, that the most ambitious companies actually don't want to just work on reporting and disclosing the very bare minimum. They'd much rather be actively creating and shaping markets in a green direction too so that they can be more competitive. So I think the center's role for me is very clear and it's to get to a meaningful engagement between these different economic actors, between public, private, between citizens and, and everyone else. Um, and to consider the long-term collaborative nature of innovation and not just technological innovation, although that's hugely important in this space, but for policy innovation, for business strategy innovation, for organizational, for cultural and for governance innovation to get us towards the green transition that we all know is needed. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Martha. So finally in this group then, and finally in the panel, Carolyn Hicks, and who is co-founder of Broad Power. Carolyn. Thank you. Um, so I, when I think about this center um, in terms of what the clean tech entrepreneur would need from it, uh, two things come to mind. One is space and one is voice. So I think this center has a great opportunity to use both the virtual and the physical space that's being provided to it to bring together entrepreneurs of different types and um, expertise required to bring clean tech startups off the ground. Um, I'm hopefully looking forward to many future conversations with my uh, fellow startups uh, commiserating on things that have happened or giving advice. Um, we learn a lot from each other when we're able to have a physical location where we can um, share ideas and experiences. And the second one is voice. Um, myself and my team, we work in the niche area of battery management systems. We are on the cutting edge of this niche area. And I know that there are regulations that could come into place that could help this space, that could help uh, climate change, it could help influence the outcome. So it may be a niche small space, but it could have major impact. And by being able to lend our voice to an organization that has an even larger voice, we could make a, a major impact. Thank you very much, Carolyn. So that's, uh, that's the panel, whether you'll see Alyssa and Lucinda in a moment. And um, so these are the, the first exam question, but we asked you all to provide questions before you, uh, before you came tonight. And we've had an absolutely amazing response. And uh, so, but please do keep sending questions in uh, if you, something occurs to you while you're, while you're uh, listening now. So we've combined some of the questions and we'll get to as many as we can today, um, but they won't all be answered, I'm afraid, but they will be answered in future. So they will be answered in writing later on. So we'll, we'll tell you about that. So we'll go on with the questions now, and I'm going to sort of read these questions. And we have a, a few people that I'll uh, put the finger on to start with. And if anyone else is absolutely bursting, come at, at me about it, but we've, we've got limited time and I'll try and get through as many questions as possible. So 
Well, let's go with the first one then. And this from John Gibbon to Lord Howell. With the UK responsible for 1% of global emissions, will you be focusing on globally scalable climate change innovation or on more local action? So can I turn to Lucy first on this one? Yeah, thanks, Sir, Sir Brian. Um, so at the heart of our research at the Centre for Net Zero are um, data-driven models and simulations of energy systems, which we're using to try to understand the potential impact of different technologies, different market structures and, and different human behaviours. Um, so therefore, it would be harder for us to start at a global scale with, with meaningful granularity, um, but it's much easier for us to start at a more local scale, so uh, nationally, regionally or, or on a city level. The key thing that we're really focused on is bringing a piece or pieces of the puzzle to the table um, and to enable like-minded people and organisations to, to bring their own pieces of the puzzle uh, to the table too. So we're going to start by looking at electrification of roads, passenger transport and of domestic heating in, in the UK. Um, and we have the data needed to build detailed agent based models of those two things and to understand uh, people's behaviours and validate that those behaviours are representative of larger populations. So um, effectively to look at a small piece of the system and to credibly understand how it might apply to the system at large. Um, but I'd also say let's not overlook that some of the things that are globally scalable will start out as more locally focused initiatives and interventions. Um, there are many examples of global movements which started life as more localised action. Um, and so we need to stop thinking that this is someone else's problem to solve and that we as a country or an individual are too small to make a, a meaningful dent. Thank you very much, Lucy. Uh, Caitlin, would you like to add anything to that? Thank you. Yes, I would like to. I think um, the, there's a responsibility to acknowledge where we've come to. And I think the UK had a huge role in the Industrial Revolution. And I think this question was targeted at the fact that, yes, we might have a small percentage of the total global emissions, but we have a very powerful technical know-how here with all the universities we have. We have a very powerful financial hub here and a lot of entrepreneurs. So I think that it makes complete sense to try to think globally and scalably how we can take the, the knowledge and expertise that are in the UK to try and help at a global scale. So I would say that the centre could help project that. Okay, Caitlin, thank you. Shirley, would you like to uh, say something about this as well? Is it yeah, um, or is it more? No, no, no. We, we absolutely have to do both. You know, um, we have a responsibility for dealing with our own emissions and we have to remember that cities are huge uh, producers of emissions and we are massive consumers. So whilst we might be responsible locally for direct emissions, you know, in a not a very significant amount. We're massive consumers uh, of emissions produced elsewhere. So we do have that responsibility. Um, completely agree that, you know, in London, we can demonstrate, deliver sort of local action that can be scaled up. And we, there are many things that we've been doing in London um, that either we've copied from abroad or that we're um, producing examples that other people, uh, other cities can take on in other countries. And we're working with networks of cities in the UK and beyond, for example, the C40, to share knowledge and expertise um, and innovate. Um, and absolutely behind all of this is scale up. We know we're in a decade of action. So the scaling up, accelerating that scale up is critical. Thank you very much. Uh, I think uh, we've, we've heard the message. So I'm going to go on to question two now, which is Sachin Kapila and Nicola Swan wrote something like this. So how will the center help institutions to better understand and quantify their exposure to physical climate risks? Will the climate risk reporting emerging in, in the EU, UK and NZ spread more widely? And Tony, would you like to have a kick off on this one? Sorry, I just wanted to make sure that I didn't have the uh, same problem I had last time. Uh, look, we, um, in terms of how um, the physical address uh, issues are going to be addressed, we think that the centre is going to bring together the world leaders in the physical climate modelling and scenario analysis, businesses that are leading on the disclosure of climate impacts, policy makers shaping the regulatory landscape on disclosure. Uh, this intersection of all those stakeholders will advance the disclosure agenda through a collaborative innovation. 
So advancements in science and technology driven by the centre, such as satellite mapping, measurement technologies, uh, the Internet of Things platforms will enable impacts to be quantified and monitored more efficiently in real time. The growing momentum around climate disclosure that we're seeing already in the EU, UK, uh, New Zealand will certainly proliferate globally. And this has been considered a feature of President Biden's climate agenda. And it's been looked at earnest in other parts of the world, such as Canada and, uh, and Australia. Uh, we should not, however, under, understate the challenges of opaque data reporting in certain jurisdictions. So there's limited transparency in private markets as well, and the administrative challenges for the SMEs. But these markets are likely to catch up over time. We're already seeing signals of change coming from China, for example, uh, and the development of global energy infrastructure emissions database, which provides high resolution carbon dioxide and air pollutant emission products right across the global infrastructure assets. Uh, another area of evolution we see, of course, is the task force on nature uh, related financial disclosures. So uh, following TCFD, uh, TNFD, and uh, we're a member of the working group on this. And this is providing a framework for corporates and financial institutions to assess, manage and report on their de dependencies, but also their impacts on nature and aiding in the appraisal of that risk. Thanks, Brian. OK, thank you, Tony. Um, Martha, would you like to add anything to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the other speakers have said it all, but I mean, risk reporting will only grow as regulations um, increase, such as the TCFD reporting requirements in the UK. And this makes climate risk all the more immediately material to companies, to other organisations. Um, moving the kind of physical, the transition and the liability risks from being something on the horizon to being something here in the everyday. And I think that really is changing. But I think um, it needs to be not just a quantitative thing. I think sometimes um, it's not always clear to companies how to go about reporting. I think this can stymie some of their ambitions, perhaps. Um, and whilst a metrics approach is needed to materialize risk, some of the work that has to be done that has to be picked up is more qualitative. So mindset shifts, cultural and organizational shifts. Um, and I think it's really, you know, learning and education can't be underestimated, getting people together to, to make this journey um, hand in hand. Um, so that's kind of where I would, would place thinking about climate risk. Thanks very much, Martha. Michaela, would you like to add anything to that? I think they've said everything. I think the only thing I would add is um, I, I think we can expect a, a big focus on this in COP26. So I'm sure Mark Carney in his role as the UN Special Envoy and Advisor um, is, is got climate risk reporting um, on, on his runway. And I, I suspect he'll be asking the UN delegation to support mandatory reporting. So um, I think that's, that's enough for me to add, Brian. Thanks very much, Michaela. Um, so let's move on to the next question. Anna, George, and Sam T uh, contribute to this. Are financial institutions doing enough to encourage climate change innovation? And what areas would you like to see them focusing on in the coming years? Can they encourage climate abatement amongst their clients? So Michaela, I'm going to turn to you again on this one. Yeah, um, no, that's fine, Sir Brian. Um, Definitely. Um, we recognise we could do more, which is why we, we are supporting the centre. Um, and this is part of our, as, as I mentioned earlier, our, our new philanthropic pro programme that's a hundred million dollar donation to scale up climate innovation. Um, and so, and we've also, in addition to that, we've, we have a dedicated unit um, and they will tailor finance to support clean tech innovation and that's targeting another a further 100 million to clean tech investment within our technology venture debt fund so um, last year we, I was really pleased we announced our, our net zero strategy so net zero operations and supply chain by 2030 but to align our finance emissions to net zero by 2050 
So I think the second part of that question is crucial, Brian, which is we really recognize that the most significant contribution we can make is to support our customers to progressively decarbonize, um, whilst ensuring ongoing resilience as well and, and prosperity. So in, in the UK, we've launched our net zero guide to business with carbon intelligence, and that's really helping those businesses that probably the more mid large larger corporates but to think about science-based targets and really actively reduce their absolute emissions and and we're really focusing on on that and and encouraging them to only start thinking about offsets when for the really hard to obey and unavoidable emissions so i think providing that guidance and then we've got more guides coming out for smes as well which is another important area and, and, and contributor to the uk economy thanks that's a very full answer so i i think i'm going to rush on to the next question i hope it's not too much rushing but that, so there's a number of people who contributed or similar ideas here. So there's Law Latham, Laura Hawkin, Julie Ling Wong, Jorge Aponte and Ivan Bio. How should the partnership ensure that it creates opportunities that benefit more than just the usual crowd of climate aware people? Um, right, I'm going to turn to two who haven't been seen yet or certainly haven't spoken yet. So Lucinda, Lucinda Hunt from the Royal Institution. Lucinda, over to you. Thank you very much, Sabrian. Um, yes, I think this is a really interesting question and it gets to the heart of the public engagement challenge. Uh, I think there is very good evidence that people are climate concerned and I think young people in particular are committed to tackling climate change. But being climate concerned doesn't necessarily mean the same as being climate aware. And what we want is for everyone to be aware of the evidence and what it really means and aware of the technologies that are being developed and, of course, aware of the best ways of making a personal contribution. And uh, our view at the RI is that locating the centre at the Royal Institution and using our channels, which include public talks and our family and education programmes and our international reach, particularly through YouTube, will ensure that we can communicate scientific advances and new technologies to the broadest audience possible. Um, and I think that it's really important that we don't underestimate the importance of wider public engagement. And this has been mentioned a little bit in some other people's answers as, as we've gone through. Um, and I do think we can learn some lessons from this pandemic. The better we are at including everyone in new ideas in science, and the more successful um, the uptake uh, and enthusiasm for new behaviours and techniques will be. And I think that uh, some of the um, initiatives during this past year have shown us how the more engaged people are and the more they understand about the science behind change that's needed, the, the more enthusiastic and able they are to, to support it. So uh, I think it's a really important feature of the founding partners of the new centre that we all feel that it's a priority to involve hard to reach audiences and marginalised communities. And that's something that the RI is looking forward very much to leading on. Thank you very much, Lucinda. And I'd like to turn to Alyssa now, Alyssa Gilbert, who's the interim director of this uh, new climate uh, Centre for Innovation. And Alyssa, over to you. Yeah, thank you. So building on what Lucinda said, I think it's really evident that we cannot reach our very ambitious climate change targets without everybody. You know, we need absolutely everyone. And that's not only to achieve our ambitious greenhouse gas emission reduction targets and resilience uh, targets, but it's also to, um, yeah, well, it's a uh, also to be inclusive and to make the most of the fact that we have this center in London. So why are we doing the center in London? It's not just because of all of the great climate community that we've gathered here, but it's also because of London's diverse strengths of other kinds of communities that may not be part of the climate conversation or climate action yet. And we really want to have those people come through the doors of the Royal Institution, both physically where they can and virtually um, perhaps where they cannot. And so I'm, I'm really thinking about uh, how can we do this 
fairly? Um, and also, what are the practical parts of this? If I'm, I'm going to be the interim director of this, so I always now asking myself the practical question, what does that mean in practice? So, well, we're going to start by mapping out who are those partners? Who are those communities that we want to welcome in? And we're going to start, obviously, with some of the climate usual suspects, but that's why we've got the GLA on board to help us connect with the wide, full range of London's community. Um, and we're going to be actively building those relationships to bring them in. And the other really practical action that we're going to take, um, I hope, seeing all the other partners on the panel, is that each of these partners here represent a different theme. Um, we've got energy, we've got finance, we'll have resilience and engineering. And each of those partners are going to help us connect and invite in the mainstream of their industry towards us and our challenge around climate change. Um, so, as I said, it's going to be actively building relationships and really uh, representing and working with uh, London's diverse communities. Thank you, Alyssa. And I'm going to move on to the next question, which is also about getting to the other people. It's uh, Zomaka, Nomara, and others, uh, do you envisage establishing partnership plans to work with overseas climate change organizations, SMEs, etc., and what might these involve? And I'm going to turn to you again, Alyssa. Yes, okay, so I'll continue with my practical hat. Uh, absolutely, we can't again solve this. It's a global challenge and we need global partnerships and relationships. Um, and we've gone some way to that already, in fact. So I know that there are international partners, collaborators on this call, part of this launch already that has spoken to us, investors that have reached out or leaders on global policy innovation, something that Martha referred to is important. We're not just thinking about technical innovation. So uh, we're going to do that from the beginning. And also many of the founding partners are actually very international already in their reach. So some of that will occur naturally. Um, but at a very practical side, um, a bit like Lucy said when she described how she's starting to build the research in, in the Octopus Center, um, some of what we'll have to do is really focus on building a very strong core um, with our London communities um, so that we're really, you know, enriched with that diversity and then building at the same time those international networks. Um, and hopefully in due course, we'll be able to be quite comprehensive in our international partner mapping. Um, but I, I see something that's happening first of all, organically, of course that's necessary, but then building on, on our strengths and approach as we go forward. Thank you, Alyssa. I'm going to end that one there too. To move on to the next one, Patricia, Patricia Bader, Johnston, Daniel Smith and Gareth have contributed to this. Do you see addressing climate change as a technical problem with technological solutions, or do you see the need for deeper systemic change and a fundamental rethink of how we view our socioeconomic systems? Jeff, over to you. Thanks. I think this is called the hospital pass question, isn't it? I mean, it's, I think the answer, the answer, of course, is that it's both. Uh, and that there's all sorts of technical problems uh, which need technical solutions, you know, energy distribution, carbon capture and storage, and how do you address long distance travel, um, you know, the, the uh, reduction of emissions in hard to abate industries. Those are, those are, those are technical problems. But there's also you know hearts and minds things we've talked about the public engagement element but how do you persuade people to move along this this journey this trajectory um, uh, with you you know some of the solutions to climate change are about consumption they're about eating they're about travel it's about the way we 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 live in our homes what we do with our time and then there's also big sort of socio-economic questions i mean somebody once said quite some time ago now that it was easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Uh, it doesn't seem such a funny remark anymore. Um, and, and I think to, to, to look at climate change as purely a technical issue is to see it in, a, in only one dimension. Uh, and uh, we're not going to solve this just with technology. It will require significant behavioural change and significant systems change and I'd also say that uh, you, you can't really go about addressing climate change without also addressing many other socioeconomic problems, such as inequality, poverty, pollution, uh, etc. So it's a, it's a massively complex systems problem. Technology is only just one part of it, it seems to me. Thank you, Jeff. Martha, would you like to add anything? 
Yeah, thank you, Sabra. And I mean, I completely agree. Um, a just driving mantra for me that innovation needs to be recognized beyond the technical. And if you're talking like the UK is about a green industrial strategy or green, or green industrial revolution, we need to remember that the original industrial revolution was far from just siloed to technical change. It was a lifestyle overhaul. It changed economic and social infrastructure. It set the direction for long-term development pathways of innovation. Um, and a concept I think it's worth bringing to the table here is um, that of the just transition, the fair and the equitable transition. So how can we transition into a greener world, recognizing the need to address workers in polluting and unsustainable industries, um, how to retrain, how to redirect careers and industries. And this touches on industry, but it's also about welfare. And in the wake of, of COVID-19, it's also about a kind of a lot of, you know, groups such as international trade unions are calling for a pandemic social contract, rethinking the roles of different types of workers, of logistical and retail and key workers that we've all relied on. And how can we extend this conversation into that just transition, that to and through build back better moment that we're in? Um, so yeah, it has to look way beyond the technical to the, to the personal. Thank you very much, Martha. Yeah, I think I'm going to move on to the next question now. I'm sure there's others who like to answer that, but um, there's a question here from Brigitte Small and Carolyn Basso. Um, how will advanced digital technologies, such as the development and integration of big data, blockchain, AI, be used to develop a greener future? Rather different question. So Carolyn, would you like to think about this? Uh, sure. Um, I mean, I see a big opportunity in being able to use uh, more information, better information, better computational methods to um, find solutions to, to climate change. Um, and, and in fact, I mean, the basis of our technology is about doing more with what already exists inside of a battery pack. And so with more data, you can do that as long as you're uh, sort of doing the right analysis. So I guess I would layer on the warning that um, every model is only as good as the data that goes into it, and not every computational method is appropriate for the questions that you're asking it. And on top of that, from an energy perspective, some of these um, new technologies like blockchain actually have a pretty major energy requirement in order to execute them. So um, yes and no, I think there's a great opportunity. There's a lot of reason to be excited about it, but it's definitely not the, the whole picture. Okay, thank you, Carolyn. Lucy, would you like to add anything? Um, yeah, thanks, Sir Brian. Um, so a AI can be used right now to, to optimize um, energy intensive uh, industrial manufacturing processes um, and, and, and other similar things to make them more energy efficient. Um, if we want to balance supply and demand for a grid that runs on more variable renewable energy sources, then we really need to know what's happening or to be able to forecast what we expect will happen um, across an increasingly complex and distributed system. So um, big data will, will be the foundation uh, for that. And AI is one of the tools that we can deploy to help us um, understand the data and to make good decisions um, off the back of it. Um, in terms of blockchain, um, it, it might have an application for ensuring more transparency in the system. So for instance, um, through having a, a publicly uh, available um, digital ledger of, of carbon credits, for instance, for organizations who are purchasing credits to offset their emissions, um, to ensure that the same offsetting activity isn't credited as an offset more than once, um, and also potentially to support the um, possibility of more decentralized systems through um, enabling the use of smart contracts. Thank you there, Lucy. Uh, Caitlin, would you like to add anything to that? Thank you. Yeah, I think, um, Lucy, that's a, a great point on the, the carbon point, because I, I think data and transparency is something that's really important for trying to get traceability for longevity and commitments because there's been great progress with companies making pledges to net zero but actually holding them accountable i think there's a lot that we can learn from technology and and using that to to empower i think there is a question around how the energy intensity of data centers and and the way that you're doing it there's also a responsibility that has to be placed on on doing it in a way that's efficient that's also not costing the earth thank you very much okay i think we'll we'll move on then to a question Anne amelie uh, what role do you think nature-based solutions, as opposed to technological discoveries, will play towards a greener future for our world? Tony, would you like to handle that? 
Sure, certainly. Uh, look, I think the, um, the recent Das Gupta report made it very clear to all of us that, um, that we had failed nature and we'd failed to live sustainably. And uh, one thing about nature-based solutions is that generally broader than technological solutions. So an example, for example, might be protecting a coastal, uh, a coastline. Uh, you can plant mangroves, for example, and it's a project we're looking at at the moment, actually, um, in Pakistan. And you get climate resilience from cyclones, but you also get fabulous sequestration of carbon. So you can actually uh, do different things with this. So um, uh, nature can play in, uh, an incredibly important part. And I think it's something uh, uh, like Lucy mentioned with respect to uh, AI, uh, it's actually available now. That's the other important point about nature-based solutions. So you don't actually have to wait for them. Uh, they're here with us right now. And um, so we're planning on working with the center and uh, actually going to work on natural capital innovation hubs. Um, and so basically, uh, we'll be able to um, uh, formulate together uh, new ideas in terms of, because a lot of people don't realize they think it's binary, if you like, when you're looking at decarbonization, it's either engineering or it's nature. Uh, there's a lot of science in nature. And so, uh, so there's a lot of crossover. So we're looking very much looking forward to working with the center on these uh, innovation hubs. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Nature's been doing it for some time, isn't it? Yes, it's got a start on us. All right, I think I'm going to move on to the next one. So Dan Epstein and Mark Bornhoff, how do we get much more rapid and effective take up of innovation in construction and development, which are industries that are fairly conservative? How can we help the building trades decarbonize? I think it's over to you for that one, Barbara. Thank you, Sir Brian. Yeah, I, um, I think so. The construction industry is conservative in in some ways, and then in other ways, it's achieved some amazing, highly innovative solutions over the years. But it's a major contributor to the UK's carbon emissions at over thirty percent, and so it's critical and part of why Arab, you know, are very keen to be involved here that this industry prioritizes decarbonization agendas and very soon. Um, the construction industry needs to go through a transformational change. So not something that's slow or steady. It needs to be transformational and play its part in reaching um, the net zero targets. Um, that can only happen if we set ourselves bold targets and stretch ourselves as an industry but this is going to really depend on, on government and targets from government and asking the industry to stretch itself. Um, there are some particular areas of focus. I'll just briefly go through, Sir Brian. You know, the industry needs to embed low carbon design and to implement that at scale. Um, we need to revisit our design and performance standards and take a new approach to risk to improve the carbon performance of our infrastructure. And we really need to look at our existing assets and how we can improve those. There is some tremendous opportunities for innovation in how to improve our existing assets. And Arup and many others think there is an urgent need for change in procurement practice by government. So there's a better definition of value around whole life carbon performance and not just short term costs. I think I'll leave it there, Sir Brian. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Yes. Yeah. You said about government setting the field and not going away from it once they get a few people saying it's going to be difficult. Yeah. OK, so I, I'd like to move on to another question. Sally Castles and Dino Zardi, um, how can we get this onto the national education agenda so that relevant staff are obliged to include climate issues in their courses. How will students be involved in the activities of the centre? That's a natural for you, Liz Sindra, I think. Thank you, Sir Brian. I'm never quite sure about um, obliging any staff to um, behave in a particular way, but I completely understand the, what's behind the question. And as some of you know, I come from an education background myself. So I spent many years teaching science and then I was head at a London school. 
Um, climate change is, of course, already on the national curriculum. Um, but I think many climate change campaigners would say, but not enough. Um, and of course, I do agree absolutely that covering climate change in the curriculum is, is really important. This is the defining challenge of our age and it touches everybody's lives. And of course, children should learn about it in school. And I certainly think it shouldn't be restricted just to the science curriculum. There are clearly um, opportunities in subjects such as economics and geography and citizenship and I think those sorts of changes are beginning to happen. At the RI, one of the things that we are really looking forward to contributing to this very challenge is that we feel that where there are gaps in the curriculum, some of those are things that we can fill and that we're very well placed to do so. Uh, we've got a lot of links with schools all over the country, schools from all sorts of different kinds of backgrounds and situations. And uh, we run education programmes which are, um, enable us to, to tackle subjects which, which there might not be space and time for in the curriculum, and very much in a way that's about, that's about a conversation. And we've already been increasing our environmental content in, in a lot of those areas. So this for us is an extension of work that we've already been um, focusing on. Uh, we also run summer schools and active activities for families uh, which engage th thousands of children and I think we all know that support at home for science education is a really important part of how well children adapt to science and really start to, to grow an enthusiasm for it and I think that will be true for action against climate change too that we have to work with families as well as schools in order to reach our young people and of course, young people are very, very much aware of climate change and increasingly they are the ones who are leading the campaign to address it. The, the, the other thing that the RI is really looking forward to in this collaboration is that um, our involvement with the centre is two ways. So we feel we've got the routes through to pupils and students and their families and schools. But by working with Grantham and all of the other founders, and it's been fascinating listening to you all from all of your different perspectives and different sorts of organisations. What we will have is a lot of very exciting and engaging new content that we can share through those routes. So uh, for me, this, this feels like a, a very exciting new kind of leap forward in, in the work that, that we're already doing and that will take us some way to answering that question, I hope. Should be really exciting, yes. Good. I'd like to move on to another question by Diane G. Do you think it's best to focus on getting to net zero in the least disrupted, most robust way? For example, don't exist, insist on simultaneously improving society through climate justice and using only nature-based solutions and no fossil fuel. Won't it be hard enough to get the engineering and econ economics to work? without these extra constraints. Shirley, how about that? What do you think? So, uh, <clears throat> you can't take that, that sort of single approach. You have to um, look at it in the round. You know, that they're, they're all interconnected. There's social and environmental and economic impacts. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they have relevance to, to lots of different people. So you have to work with uh, the community. So it's really great to hear everybody talking about how they want to engage with with Londoners to really develop and understand what what are the solutions, what are their concerns, and those concerns around no fossil fuels are important to to, to people. Nature based solutions, as well as um, taking some of the technological um, approaches that, that 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 we know that are possible. Um, but you know we are going to need that sort of systemic change and bring people along. The pandemic is a real example about the sort of inequalities that we face in London that's really been highlighted and I think that's that's really what we need to be um, understanding and listening to people as we develop those and accelerate the solutions that the centre is going to help us with. Thank you Shirley. Jeff, are you happy with that? Uh, I absolutely agree with that. I mean the climate change doesn't have any concept of fairness in it and then there's everyone on the on on this world is going to have to change the way they go about things and if we ask the the most disadvantaged people to share what is a a rateable proportion of the burden of dealing with this they just it's just not going to work so i, I don't think this is a one-dimensional problem at all 
Thank you. Um, and I hope those uh, with us on this launch can just stay another 10 minutes because I'd like to squeeze in another three questions that I can with one person only answering each. So, and then we'll wrap things up. So the next one is Peter Bounce, Franz and Kevin. Many necessary innovations exist already. So will you work on which innovations can make a real difference, how to combine them into useful systems and to identify the key enablers to deployment at scale? I'm going to put that to Barbara. Thank you. I think the answer is yes. Is it appropriate to say yes? That's fine. Um, and I think the uh, more productively, the the center by having so many different partners across so many different disciplines and from different viewpoints, we're in a much better position to actually prioritize those instead of trying to do that on our own, we'll be able to make a much better prioritization because we're going to work together. Yeah, I think that, that says it all. Thanks. And I'm going to move, I'm squeezing two more in then. So Jim Cunningham and others, how do you envisage policymakers working with the centre? Would you see a role supporting climate assemblies? Lucinda? Thank you, Sabrian. Um, yes, so um, policymakers, and um, I would include business leaders in, in that category, have an enormous power in deciding how scientific advances get applied in our lives. And so I think policymakers are going to be a very important audience for this new centre. Um, and in some ways, <clears throat> it presents a sort of golden opportunity to demonstrate the technologies and innovations and to bring the public's voice into that policy making and facilitate a real conversation. And um, I think it's part of the centre's operation that Grantham and all of the other partners have, have got a kind of capacity to be, to be part of. Um, I don't think for us at the RI that's going to fundamentally change um, our way of working because we already have strategic objectives that are about engaging with policymakers and bringing them together with the site with scientists and with the public and I and I guess it comes back again to that thing about what public engagement really means so um, we're hoping that that this new centre will actually for us it will help to strengthen our scope for for engaging with policy development perhaps because it's such an obvious area in which we must all be engaged that it will help to begin to bring policymakers into that sort of conversation and to be beginning to understand that that's actually how all of innovation should be should be tackled. So um, just just on the on the thing about um, climate assemblies themselves, we we would certainly encourage um, any organisations that want to engage with the latest science and technology and bring that to us. And I think it's another two way relationship where we're also then there for our members and our audiences and all of the new audiences that we're hoping we will bring in to support them is sort of empowering them as active citizens. So, um, yeah, I'd just like to say again that I think informed and engaged uh, public engagement is absolutely essential for the success of the centre and more importantly, as other people have touched on, for the the world's collective efforts to tackle the climate change crisis. This is something that we are all part of. Thank you, Lucinda. I have a last question then, which is a must for a list of this one. As interim director, it's got to be yours. How will the organization measure its impact? Over to you. Thanks, great. Uh, immediately something on my to-do list then. Um, I, I think it's, it's of course, um, famously challenging to measure the impact of a catalyst, um, which is what we intend to be as an organization. And I think at the one end, I could answer this question quite simply by saying, we're going to measure all of the activities we do. How many public events do we have? How many roundtables with policymakers? How many training sessions for different people do we have? How many people walk in through our doors to see exhibitions um, or come in to have conversations with each other? Um, but then in a way, I would hope that the person who asked this question would be disappointed and tell me that I haven't actually measured impact. I've only stroked my ego for having applauded myself for all of the things that we managed to do on our action list. In fact, the ultimate measure of impact will be how many greenhouse gas emission reductions did we contribute to? 
How much improved resilience did we deliver by reducing the vulnerability of London's population and reducing their exposure to climate change impacts? And what co-benefits did those things deliver in terms of health and well-being, in terms of money made or costs avoided? Um, but that will be quite hard. I think we'll try to do that. And um, what I want to try and measure is something in the middle, which is how much buzz do we create? How exciting is this activity? How many, how many new partners do we reach beyond these founding members? Um, what is the extent of this reach? How many big flagship ideas do we get off the ground that show that you can deliver emissions reductions? And how much are they copied? We want people to copy what we do and multiply that. So what's our multiplier effect? Um, so I think some, some pedestrian measures we'll take, um, but some more ambitious measures of impact too. Good, thank you very much. And I said we look forward, pedestrian and others, cyclists or something, yes. Okay, thank you. I, at that point, I mean, I'd love to go on, but I, I fear we have to stop now. Um, I would re really like to thank all the panelists for their, their wonderful responses here, and all those who've asked, asked the questions as well. And they will all get answered, even though they haven't been talked about tonight. So um, we, we bring this to an end now, which is a bit sad in some ways, but it's, uh, it's not sad because it's brilliant. I mean, I think there's something here that's really positive and really exciting. And I hope you might have detected a, a few signals coming through this. And I hope you've seen that this is something that is really open to a community of innovators seeking to act on climate, engaging broadly and with purpose. And that's what we're after. I think one of the things we've seen too is that this is founded by one generation, and perhaps those at the beginning had rather grey hair and tended to be rather male. Um, but it, um, it is on behalf of the younger and future generation. I know, Shirley, it doesn't apply to you, that comment earlier, early on, but the, the rest of them were. And, but it's actually found very much on behalf of the younger and future generations, and with women seen as being in a leadership role. That's very much come through here. So thank you very much to all of you involved. Um, thank you for joining us tonight, all those who've been watching, and we really look forward to your involvement with us in this new venture. Please come and see us. Thank you. Good night. <laughs>